It is a terrifying experience when the Kundalini is awakened. The first day the fire was kindled in me, I thought I was dying. The whole body was, as it were, on fire. Mind was being broken to pieces. The bones were being hammered. I did not understand what was happening. In three months I drank gallons of milk and clarified butter, ate leaves of two nimba trees, till they were left without a single leaf, searched everywhere for the mudra leaves, and devoured these insipid things. During that period I could not sit in any posture. I could not stand. I used to lie down on my bed and repeat the name of Lord Datatreya. I know of cases where the fire was not brought under control for six or eight months. One Mahatma told me that he used to sit under a cold water tap for eight hours every day. There is no danger to life unless the rules and discipline are abandoned. It is only an act of purification through which everyone must go if he wants to attain. That is a description of the awakened Kundalini, um, which is a tantric yoga uh, serpent force that is supposed to lie dormant at the base of all of our spines and once it's awakened our minds are blown and we suddenly understand everything that there is to know about the universe etc. As a skeptic I really can't believe in stuff like that um, and the amount of effort required to investigate such things is simply something I'm not willing to invest. Um, I really have no desire to get into stuff like that. But what interests me in that passage is the implication that one comes up so often in philosophical uh, discussion that actually discovering the fundamental nature of reality can shatter your mind to atoms. From uh, Plato's allegory of the cave, where the chained prisoner who's been down below in a cave all of his life, a dark place and had nothing but shadows to look at, is suddenly thrust out into the sunlight of broad daylight and sees everything out in the real world, he's possibly going to go crazy. Uh, to uh, just about any sort of uh, mind-expanding kind of philosophy out there, if you actually see the reality of the universe for what it really is, if your mind is boxed in. If your mind is used to living in a certain groove and has taken these grooves as reality itself, you are in for one hell of a shock when you see reality for what it really is. <clears throat> I just chose that um, quote from Sri Parohit Swami um, not because I believe in any of that uh, uh, tantra stuff, but simply because it's a very vivid uh, illustration of the truly blown mind. Um, but one thing that I really liked about that quote as well is that it emphasizes discipline, self-discipline. You have to be disciplined before you get into these things. Anything that's likely to shake your mind to pieces um, is something that should only be approached uh, after very careful consideration of the potential consequences and um, with a very rigorous self-discipline. That, um, what got me thinking along these lines was the video that I made yesterday or the day before, whatever, about getting into other beliefs <clears throat> and people's fear of contamination. Let's say, for example, I want to understand what it was that... Um, prevailed upon the minds of certain people to turn them into Nazis. In order to fully understand that, I have to convince myself in some sort of deep-down, sort of simian way, uh, that Nazism is a philosophy I want to follow. <laughs> now, that's, um, that's asking for trouble if you're not disciplined and you're not confident enough of your ability to come back out of that state. My imagination is... I believe, I have no way of verifying this, but I believe my, my imagination is abnormally vivid. So I have that capacity. I can, for a second there, 
become whatever. I can become a bird flying around in the sky, or I can uh, become a, a jihadi, or something like this, with the full, perhaps unreasonable confidence that I'm going to come back to myself. And I've done this in many a case, and I've always come back. Um, and I believe that it has something to do with A, personality types, and B, um, some kind of mental discipline which enables one, as it were, <coughs> to exist in two levels of thinking at the same time, with the real one in control of the situation at all times. If I, on the other hand, I had no self-discipline and I decided that I was going to become a Nazi to see what it's like to be a Nazi, or to join the Hare Krishnas, say, because I want to know what it's like to be a Hare Krishna, I may never come out. I may never... Uh, I, I may decide that I'm a white supremacist from here on in and uh, to heck with all my dumb ideas before. But <clears throat> I think it's fair enough to say that I'm skeptical enough of any kind of ism that I don't really think any of these things can sort of pull me into them. Reckless uh, uh, indifference, perhaps, I don't know. But so far, I've managed to avoid that, that possible trap. So if you actually want to have, or if you want to actually see reality for what it really is, if you actually want to give up on all your biases, you'd better be prepared for the consequences. Now, some people, I think, don't believe in anything around them anymore. They don't believe in the value of their own existence or the value of existence itself. They're not quite sure who they are, what they are, um, or what reality is, and yet they're not quite ready to uh, take the necessary steps to see reality for what it is. It's a bizarre kind of half-state where you've abandoned reality in terms of any value you place on it, and yet you can't let go of it because you're frightened of the consequences of being that prisoner in the dark cave suddenly thrust up into the sun. That's kind of an arrogant thing to say when, when you say that most people who are, um, I guess, anti-natalists or are fundamentally negative about the universe are mad about life or depressed about life or sad about life and yet really cannot abandon it. Abandon it, and that's, that's a tricky thing to say to abandon life. I would just say loosen your grip on it because you're gripping it far too tight even after you've abandoned your belief in it. I don't really know if there's any way out of that cul-de-sac. Uh, <laughs> that's a horrible condemnation of people who um, are convinced antinatalists of the morbid sort, who are, or who are convinced negative people, who say that life has no meaning, and yet it's the only possible meaning that there is. Uh, how do you get out of that loop? I don't know. I think that that loop, in many ways, is depression itself. You don't believe in anything, but you can't give it all up yet. Um, I'm not saying that I've given it all up yet. Uh, look around you. I own a house. I have a life. I have a family, etc. I have friends. I have habits and things that I enjoy doing. But I think that... In my own case, there's enough of a disconnect from it all, and again, that might simply be my um, my own personality type. There's enough of a disconnect from it all that it doesn't overwhelm me the way that it used to when I was depressed. Um, and I think that when I was depressed, I was pretty much convinced that the universe was a bad dream, and that uh, awakening from that only meant non-existence. Um, but I think that we're not really when, when you when you actually say that awakening from the universe is non-existence all that you're really doing is you're saying you hope it's non-existence and I think that's the fear that gnaws at you when you're depressed or when you have a fundamentally negative view of reality itself it's the fear that 
maybe it's not lights out. Most people say that they hope that life isn't uh, lights out when they die. They hope that you go to somewhere nice. But some people fear that death might not be lights out. Depressed people, if you ask me, have that fear. And it's a fear that's very, very difficult to grasp. It's the fear that if we actually do see reality, we'll be, we'll be just like Sri Purohit Swami, who has his mind smashed to atoms um, and has no way of grasping what's happening. I think that that is what a psychologist would call an existential crisis. Um, I believe that I've had an existential crisis um, in my depressed state. And this is why I have the somewhat bizarre idea that I may have actually been strengthened by going through a depressed state 20 odd years ago. Uh, the guy who wrote that uh, article, uh, that paragraph I quoted about the awakened Kundalini says at the end, A, provided the discipline is not abandoned, you're okay. It's really crazy to go through it, but you're okay. And B, you've got to go through this. If you don't have the courage to go through this, you'd best leave it alone. Or if you're not disciplined enough or self-disciplined enough, you'd best leave it alone. Only go looking for reality when you really want to see reality. And I think that a fundamentally negative view of the universe is an attempt to shield yourself from a fear of what reality might actually be. But what I do say is, how come there are people out there who consciously seek to have their mind blown in that way? Why are there people who consciously seek to be the prisoners dragged out of the cave and thrown into the bright sunlight? I would say that the existential crisis might be something that those of us who really want to understand reality itself have to go through. It's an interesting thought. Thank you.